my name is Anna Maria and I'm your host. It is such an honor and a privilege for me to have been able to speak to some amazing people on the show who are really at the forefront of making change, of inspiring people and educating and growing awareness in the field of sustainability, really just dedicating their lives to this cause. My guest on this week's show is one of those extraordinary people. She's none other than Finn Vanderer. She is a marine biologist. She works as a marine mammal observer for the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. She's a clean coast and climate change ambassador. Finn realised from quite an early stage in her career that one of the biggest impacts she could have on the place that she feels so passionately about, the sea, was to make changes in her own life with regards to changing things up to be more sustainable within her home as well as sharing that knowledge and information and passion with everyone else. So she spends quite a lot of time giving talks and showing up online to promote sustainability, creating a more plant-based diet and living plastic free. I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope you do as well. Hi Finn, how's it going? Thank you so, so much. I just want to say it's an absolute privilege and an honor to have you on the show. I'm really excited to, to chat with you today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Um, I, I just want to start off with, I'm, I'm kind of a fan. I'm, I just think <laughs> what you do and how you show up in the world is just so amazing. You kind of came into my sphere of awareness there, um, I don't know, this year actually. Mm -hmm. And ever since that, I've just been kind of following your work and love all the things you post about and well, thank you. really enjoy all the, all the interviews and chats that I've kind of seen you in and followed okay. you through. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now that that's out of the way. <laughs> so um, I guess I'd love to start off with just by getting into a little bit about how, how you came to this work, you know, yeah. I was thinking back on it for myself personally, and, and I remember growing up by the coast and just looking mm -hmm. into the little bullons, the you know, rock yeah, pools, yeah. And just being fascinated by the ocean and by nature in general. And I think many children do. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and I suppose, is, it, is that where it originated from you or where did you first realize that you wanted to dedicate your life to the sea and conservation? I think... And, and it's funny because I was actually trying to record a piece on this earlier and then I uh, didn't manage to. So um, hopefully we'll figure it out here. Um, so I think one of the things and, and one of the things I'd always love to talk to students and stuff about is like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I didn't have like a solid plan of like, I'm 10, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to be a doctor. I think when I was a child and I was a teenager, I always thought I would do something with art, but I wanted to do something practical, like design or something like that. And it was in a funny way that I think we almost never have enough respect for the things that we're good at or that are easy to us. I never thought of anything to do with the environment or outside, even though I was that kid in the rock pools overturning things and turning blue running in and out of the sea and like I learned to surf when I was 16 and spent all my spare time doing that and it was only um I started college doing um oh god commerce in Spanish in UCD in 2008 and it was only kind of doing that I was like oh great I'm going to be one of those people who learns out how, what they want to do by learning what they don't want to do first <laughs> And I went to an open day then for NUIG, maybe in the spring or of the following year. I, I can't remember. Whenever open days happen before you do your CAO again. And I met this amazing lecturer. I feel like I owe her a lot um, called Eve Daly. And I'm, like, I'm very short, blonde. And Eve was very short, blonde. <laughs> maybe like maybe only 10 years or something older than me. She looked very young at the time. Um, so she doesn't look young now she still looks young now um, <laughs> but she was talking about her work she's a geophysicist and and she was just talking about how like the earth and ocean science course in NYG would be so outdoors and so much field work and like interesting work with the environment and you could spend time at sea and I was like oh yeah I love the ocean I love being outside I like working with my hands like I my best part in school was always practical things so like things like geography or art or or the more practical side so I did physics in secondary school I didn't do biology or 
or chemistry, which ironically are the things I use a lot more now. But um, but it was the practical side of setting up experiments and stuff that I really was better at than learning theorems. So it was it was definitely her and like talking to her that got me into doing that course. And I really enjoyed that course. And yeah, so that would be so it was half deliberate, half by accident, if that answers that question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's so interesting. Um, I actually uh, got into NUIG for marine science oh, back cool. in the day when I was uh, yeah. going to sign it up for my CEO as well yeah. and uh, I deferred it for a year because I was okay. also really interested in art and oh no way <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> so yeah so then I ended up actually doing art because I got yeah. accepted into NCAG and oh, I was cool. like oh great college I have to go and do this yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my god I love yeah. it we swapped yeah 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 absolutely <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's really, really cool, cool. <laughs> um but yeah it's so interesting how just those one you know one conversation can really oh, yeah. change the course of things like it's just amazing oh it's crazy and like I think even like years later it was um so I did the undergrad in earth and ocean science I did a master's in marine biology and that that kind of came from I I worked in the national aquarium in Galway and and that was one of those ones of like when you really want something and you just brute force it so I went into the aquarium and was like I really want a job here and they were like well that's great but there's no jobs for like marine scientists or activists or whatever and I was like okay well is there any job and they were like receptionist I was like I'll take it <laughs> I'll take it started in two days a week doing the reception then started covering for the activists when they were sick or away then the wonderful education officer Noreen did uh, Dr Noreen Burke did like um education programs for like primary and secondary school students but didn't have time to do them for really small kids so then I created a program for small so then I basically made a full-time after I had done my master's I was one of the many people who got stuck doing a jobs bridge I'm really glad that they're gone <laughs> um so that was like the the government internships and I was doing one in a lab in UCD and um it was so grim I think it was my own fault for reading the description wrong so it was a a freshwater invertebrates project and I had read freshwater vertebrates just because I had been applying for so many jobs at the same time you're doing like five six applications a day so as opposed to being like oh lovely fish and salmon in the river it was like mm, all the insects and leeches in the river um so it was like sorting through trays of dead insects for like up to six seven hours a day um having nightmares about them but um but so it was sorting these trays of insects I was like listening to TED talks on like how to figure out what to do with your life or what you want to do with your life because I was just like it can't be this it can't be the trays of dead insects and I heard one by the free diver Kimmy Werner oh yeah um from Hawaii and she was talking about kind of creating jobs for herself because she was at the same time like a fully qualified chef an artist like being paid for her work a speaker and then obviously like a sponsored spear fisher woman um with patagonia and a couple of other companies and i was like oh you could do like several at the same time that's really good you can do everything you love at the same time you don't have to do one thing that's really cool so yeah that was that was where i was going with that <laughs> yeah no absolutely and i think that there's so much value in that there's there's such a kind of uh a, a tunnel vision around what we're supposed to do and how how jobs are laid out and and yeah. how to go about your life and it really I mean yeah I guess the older I get as well the more I realize that yeah you have to have several strings on your bow yeah completely and, stops you getting bored too absolutely yeah and also they all weave into one mm. another and I'm sure we're going to get into that in yeah. a, a bit later because I feel like yeah. that's exactly what you're about <laughs> But um, uh, yeah, I guess I uh, have you heard of a uh, thalassotherapy? You, you must no, have. no, tell me. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's a it's kind of therapy or a, a, a spa space where they make great <gasps> use of like uh, oh, the sea and negative yes. ions and yes, yeah, and really, like the salt therapies. Yes, exactly. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I have. So it's great for your skin, your pores, your this uh this helps our ability to absorb more oxygen into the body which is incredible yeah. for isn't it yeah really good for people with respiratory issues yeah absolutely yeah. and all yeah, of that totally so this is the way you know as as, as <laughs> humans have like really you know taken this technology from the sea yeah. and harnessed it but yeah. like, i would love to hear sort of what you get from the sea yeah for sure experience of, of being by it and well, and I love I love the idea of it as well, because that's like the modern version of, you know, when it used to be like people 
would go and people who lived inland or lived in cities would go to get the sea air you know they would go to like bath in the uk and stuff like that um, and even you see it here like i live in bundoran in donegal and um there are two different sea pools that have just like literally been cut into the rocks um just off the coast and they would be i guess not Georgian, maybe Victorian. And then they would have had like the changing huts and everything around them. I've seen the really cool um, historic pictures of them. And then even, and I'm sorry for being that person who's like a dog mom and talks about her dog, but I, we noticed it when we adopted our bulldog about a month ago or two months ago. And she had like, a, she's like a brachycef like breed. So she has like that breathing, snoring all the time. And I'm curious if the fact that every day for like an hour and a half we're like walking by the sea it's become a lot quieter and she seems to breathe easier so I'm like I am not a vet so I cannot say that that is why it's happening but I think it could be um which is pretty cool but um for me as a human as opposed to the dog um it's definitely been uh, many things so obviously like I work in the marine and that's one thing but um on a more personal level um like I said I started surfing when I was like 16 and then that was so many things because it was it was obviously sport and fitness, um, but it was also time away from your phone, time away from whatever is bothering you, which is great. And then in college, it was also pretty much like my main source of socialization. All my friends that I'm still friends with were all people who were active in the surf club. We used to go away on trips. It was travel. It was everything. And then um, kind of in years where I've had harder times, like the year of of kind of applying for jobs or trying to create jobs or anytime dealing with any kind of illness or anything like that um yeah kind of being in the sea has made a difference like um I did one thing for a while of like a dip a day it started out as whatever of like getting in the day water every day for the all of October and then it kind of just kept going for another month and it was like rain or shine getting in so if you had a beautiful sunny day like today and you got in then maybe it was the nicest thing you did that day but if it was like stormy and grim and you had bad humor it was cold miserable raining it was probably the hardest thing you did that day and then everything else was easier so yeah it's everything <laughs> that's an awesome philosophy i love it mm. my uh, my dad is he's going on 81 this year and he gets into the atlantic ocean every day same thing uh, rain or shine just yeah and he swears by it like and, where is and he based he's on inishman the iron islands so oh, cool. yeah yeah. So, yeah yeah and they've actually started like a little group out there of like oh, uh, really? people on the island who just get yeah. together and and it's built this beautiful community and, yeah, and like totally. these, these kind of things that are really intense for the body, like really bring yeah. people together. Like <laughs> Oh, completely. And like there's um I was at the sea pool near my house um last week. And like I, I've been in and out a good bit over the winter, but myself and my husband managed to get out between all the various lockdowns. We actually were living in Madeira for a couple of months. And so I obviously got a bit wussy about the Irish water temperatures. I had come down with the dog. I was got in the water and kind of went. <laughs> And then just got out again, like got in, dunked my head and got out. And there was two older ladies there. And one of them just goes, is that it? <laughs> I was like, oh, she was like, here, I'll hold your dog. Get back in. <laughs> I was like, really? She was like, come on, two minutes or it's not worth it. Get in, get in. And then, she, and then the other one was like, because you were like, good cop, bad cop. The other one was like, don't worry, pet. Like, if you haven't been in for a while, I know it's the same for myself. And why don't you just like paddle around a bit and you don't have to stick your head under again. I don't always stick my head under, it's fine. And then after about two minutes, they were both finished changing and they were ready to get in the water and they were like, ah, okay, you can get out there. <laughs> <laughs> don't get hypothermia on our account. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I, I love that like I don't know their names but I don't mind but it's great encouragement for the day so brilliant you had a little pep squad going <laughs> I know a fantastic community I have learned my lesson always bring a swim cap yeah swim cap for sure <laughs> um amazing so I guess I'd like to kind of go into uh a bit more about I guess your your job now and yeah and I I don't know how much of uh because obviously things have changed so much. I don't know if that yeah. has affected your work or what's yeah. what's going on. Um, um, yeah. So um, so I've done many random mixes of things over the years. That as I attempted to film a video and barely I realized we're not going to can never get into like a sm small amount of time. But um, basically, what I do now or what I've been doing for the last kind of two years is I split my time between um, I work freelance for the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group as a marine mammal observer. And then I obviously like create 
um, things for social media and for my website. And then I would like work with brands um, again for kind of social media website, um, but also giving like talks and, and demos and things like that. So when when COVID hit, um, I had like pretty much every event got cancelled overnight. Um, and I used to travel and stuff a lot um, kind of around the country and sometimes the UK for that. And um, my marine job was also frozen for about six weeks. When, when kind of things opened up a bit, again, um, marine construction was one of the first things that was allowed to go back. So I was actually, you know, driving the ghost roads um, up to work in Killybegs when, when most things were still closed. So that was like kind of eerie, but also nice to have some freedom. Um, and now same thing has happened again. Um, we're frozen in terms of work under the present lockdown. Um, so they, they only went back with like domestic construction, but other constructions that haven't come back. So I'll probably be doing that again in a couple of weeks. And then I've still been just, um, as lots of conferences and things go online, I'm still giving the talks kind of around sustainability and marine work, still doing that. So, so it's great. So I, I think I'm really lucky. I've been very lucky. Yeah, no, it sounds yeah. really good. Um, it's such a it's such a promotion or a step up from the um, from the searching through little boxes. Of, you know, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it took a while to get here, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so There's no more trades, Vince. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned this um, Irish whale and dolphin group that you're uh, you're an observer for. Mm -hmm. um, so in my mind, that sounds like you know one of the most awesome jobs you could ever have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, um, it does, amazing as it sounds or it's, it it's pretty cool it's pretty cool so it's well we can do the best of the worst um so it's when I started doing it again after so many years of doing food and other bits um it was unbelievably exciting to finally do a job that used my master's because I had used my undergrad but it always is a little bit of the fact that I had paid for the master's and then never used it. Um, so it was really exciting to do that for a start. But then it was also, they're a great um, group to work with. Um, really, really interesting mix of people. And then um, the actual day to day is pretty cool. Like I don't care about being cold or wet. So <laughs> um, to work outside literally all the time and then to work in like an interesting place, like a fishery sport, like, it's such a great old salt stereotypes. Like the, the retired fishermen who are walking up and down the pier, I always stop for a chat. I was like, what are you doing standing here all day? Um, and, and then there's the, the like amazing days where obviously it's a beautiful sunny day and someone rings you from the boat and is like, hey, there's like a pot of dolphins off the pier, come have a look. Or um, obviously sad, but useful is, um, we've done quite a few seal cub rescues where um, maybe like the local volunteers for, um seal rescue ireland will like come and we'll chase the poor little seal cub that's sick around the pier so that we can bring it down to the rescue center in wexford and then like this amazing group of people will basically bat on relay it across the country um through different vets and stuff and another day i think there was one day where i had a seal and a seagull in the back of my car i can't remember if it was the same day but same thing just someone local will help you chase a poor seagull that's covered in oil and then they go send off to a wildlife center so for those days for every for every two months of just standing in the rain doing nothing staring at the sea going slowly insane it's completely worth it for one day of a seal rescue yeah if that makes sense not doing nothing i'm doing something yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as in uh, yeah it's a, it's a lot of standing in the rain with the lockers yeah. for 12 hours a day so really long days really really long days you, you but, must um, be a, a breath of fresh air for those fishermen out there as well they're just oh, like <laughs> They yeah. just, they're, they're, always, they're always just like but what are you doing and then you explain it to them they're like oh right right yeah, yeah that makes sense that makes sense and um and then yeah it's the same it's it was kind of it was one of the reasons I got so grumpy about when Seaspiracy came out because I was like I work with these fishermen every day and I see them mending their nets and I see them yeah. interacting positively with seals or helping me do rescues and stuff so then see them yeah. all anyway that's a whole other chapter <laughs> yeah 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 my 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 dad is a fisherman as well so i know yeah. i know well and yeah it's uh it's hard it's it's yeah. really hard that's a yeah. yeah you're right it's a whole other topic <laughs> <laughs> whole other interview. one for another day <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so um they say if you really want to learn something you should teach it and yeah. obviously that's you know a big part of yeah. your job now as well as you were mm -hmm. saying so I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about your role as a climate ambassador and uh, yeah, sure. what are the um, important things you've learned from doing that? 
So um, that kind of side of my work and the sustainability side came from, um, um, again, just those weird things of where like one moment can suddenly become kind of important later. I was um, working on a ship at sea and we were looking at um, deep sea coral reefs. So these are like these really beautiful um, cold water coral reefs that are maybe like 2000 meters down. So it's where the continental shelf um, basically drops off into the deep sea. If you've ever seen this real map of Ireland, yeah, it's like just on the edge of the continent. So that's really cool. And we were looking at that and you're, you're expecting to see like beautiful Christine habitat. And then you're still seeing like Coke cans and a football and I think a bag of fishing line or something um, that had been sunk with a rock. And it was just, that was my first like aha moment of how much on land was affecting the ocean. And this was like kind of just pretty close to after college. So it was like before we knew, we talked about plastics the way we talk about plastics now or to talk about it overfishing the way we talk about it now. And that was my first like, oh, because then I looked around the conference table where we were all sitting and watching this kind of live video. And I was like, we all had cans of Coke <laughs> and Tato <laughs> and sweet bags. And I was like, oh, we're the problem too. We're not just the ones fixing it. That's funny, a bit grim. And, yeah. um, and that was kind of where my interest in talking to the public about science and about climate change and about plastics came because I was like oh we can sit here and we can do research until the cows come home but if nobody knows about it it's useless so so that was kind of where that came from and then I so with, around the time I swapped um my my social media and website used to be called Finns Fit Food and then it became Saltwater Stories because I wanted to talk about more about the marine and um, that was when I started sharing about sustainability and like I always wanted it to be affordable because I was always very aware of like that, that the sustainability movement was kind of being tired as a very white middle class movement, basically. And, and you know, I am still, you know, white from Ireland, obviously living a life of, of reasonable privilege. But um, but I wanted it to be that anyone who could read the website or whatever could do most of the things that I was talking about for free or for very little, um, because obviously the more people that can make change, the more use it's actually going to be. And obviously my awareness around this stuff and even just nutrition and things like that came in college when you don't have a lot of disposable income or any. So yeah. that's where I came from. <laughs> and now, so yeah, now I work with uh, a bit with Clean Coasts, talking about plastics, and then with the Climate Ambassador Programme, uh, more specifically on kind of climate and climate change related pieces. And then would just kind of write pieces for newspapers or also give like talks and stuff for um, conferences or schools or things like that. What are the what are the biggest kind of questions that come up for you in those spaces? Mm. What are the things? You... The, lo the lovely one is people are like, well, what can we do? <laughs> yeah. Let me think of some things. Um, I think I think the hardest one and one that irks me a lot is is like I can tell as many people as possible, like how to reduce plastics in their house or, you know, how to swap to green energy. But until a company like Coca-Cola last year refused to swap from plastics to tin entirely until they are forced to do something like that. There is only so much I can tell a consumer. And I, I became like really aware of that when I started working in Killy Beggs again, because I was like, you know, it's great to say that most people should get electric cars or most people should go plant-based. But when I look at the scale of industry in just a small fishing port in Ireland versus like, you know, something like Piraeus in Athens or, anything on the Bosphorus, like that level of industry is so massive and so unseen to most people that until that changes, I don't believe we'll see tangible change. So it's one of the reasons I now try not to bore people, but start to talk about more about how people can vote on policy and things like that, because that's really what's going to change. Absolutely. And, and yeah. I think people think that they haven't got any say or any voice mm. in, in, when it comes to these bigger companies, yeah. but we are the customer like and yeah, we yeah have the exactly. biggest voice you know so yeah exactly you... and so that's it because then it's that good combination of you know you vote with your dollar you vote with your euro of saying okay well if i'm still going to buy from this company i'm only going to buy their tin product or their glass product and hopefully that will push them into that level of production and then it's equally going okay well when this politician goes up for election and they're talking about banning single-use plastics well then that's going to who's going to get my vote so you have two two ways yeah voting with your vote and your financial vote yeah even yeah. on a really small scale level you can yeah. like you know write into your local pubs or restaurants yeah. and be like 
hey, I'd love to come and eat your food or drink your pints, but you really need to like up your game yeah. on the whole <laughs> yeah. reducing your plastics kind of thing, which is And I think I think the onus can be put on a town like um even here in Bandor and like we're, we're at the moment like trying to create a charter for the town because because I know what it's like to have a business and I know what it's like to be a small business where the compostable packaging costs five times the plastic one and yet all their customers want to take things away and not bring their own cup yeah. so what do you do and so we're trying to find ways to make it easier and more affordable now for the businesses to make those choices when they're already thinking about a hundred other things like their taxes <laughs> or the fact that they've been closed for a year very true very yeah. true there's a lot of big big problems at the moment <laughs> it'll all be fine yeah we'll, we will get through it we definitely will i feel, uh, I feel mm -hmm. very optimistic um so i guess where and how did this cross over between your passion for the ocean and yeah. your passion for cooking and sharing yeah awesome recipes so um it was kind of i guess a good few years ago it was um to a few different ways so it was like working at sea and realizing how hard it was to eat healthy if you did any kind of unusual work like shift work or work where um like if you worked in a hospital and you had to eat from a canteen for example I had to eat everything from the canteen on the ships um so it was like trying to find ways for for people like that or like myself to eat better because the information didn't seem to be out there um at the time as well I'd been diagnosed as celiac so it was trying to find like healthy, good ways to be gluten free because at the time it was really so, expensive. So yeah, that kind of intersection of like food and sustainability. It was the, fir the first one was definitely like um, working at sea and then talking about like ways that people could eat well um, when they were doing unusual jobs and it wasn't being talked about that much. And then that segued into um, kind of doing gluten free recipes and talking about that. And a huge thing I noticed when I was uh, being diagnosed was that I had to read the labels of everything now because I was looking for gluten. And then I was suddenly realizing all the junk that was everything in everything, like how everything was full of wheat and full of sugar. And then it was also because you're obsessively looking at the packaging, you're realizing how much packaging there is. So it was like, why is this in a box and a tray? And why is the tray also got plastic on it? Like, why is there three levels to get to the biscuits that are going to fall apart anyway? Because they're terribly made gluten free biscuits. <laughs> and so that was the first part and then I guess as I started working more and more in food I realized at the time when the conversation around things like overfishing and plastics weren't happening and I was so glum about that and wanted that conversation to happen I realized that one of the best ways I could impact change was working in the food industry because that's a lot of where the plastic is coming from that's a lot of where the lack of plant-based recipes and that kind of thing are so then by working in food I was able to make a difference which was almost like a nice place to wait until where we are now which has been really cool wasn't deliberate but that's how it worked out um but that that would definitely kind of be it and that's what led to kind of making a gluten-free zero waste bakery as well because i wanted to show um that that model could work um and i was it was really really great because it meant that even though the bakery didn't work for a bunch of different reasons a lot of them to do with the premises actually um meant that when I work now with other businesses or I do like kind of sustainability audits for them and stuff I can show the financials of like well here's what it costs you in terms of your packaging and the the, the items that you buy in but here's what it costs me for the same amount when I use no packaging when I lowered my bin costs when I you know started to buy in bulk and then they're like oh okay so it can be cheaper to be sustainable and you're like yes yeah, yeah. that's how the data and I think a lot of the time it's because people don't know where to start with that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah, like exactly. Or, or you can also like face a lot of hardship for trying, which I think is hopefully changing. Like we got eaten alive by our environmental health officer for the approved sustainable cleaning products that we were using. And that was just the lack of knowledge on, on her part. But like literally, I think on one day we were accused, like the, we were told that we would be shut down for using those approved regulated tested products that many other country uh, businesses around the country use and it wasn't until like we provided all the certificates from um from the company uh that that she was like oh sorry i guess i was wrong but it was like the stress of that was insane whereas like i have a friend who has a similar business down in sligo and she she was like oh yeah of course our eho knows what that stuff is um it's all approved so just yeah. you know it's 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 like the layers of difficulty to try and be more sustainable are it need, that needs to change yeah it's crazy 
just there there just needs to be a whole shift really on on mm. like people's knowledge of it and I know I my mum has a, a small business as well out in the Iron oh, Islands and oh, cool. I remember I went back to help her a good few years ago and I was really into like how can we make like the cleaning products that you use more sustainable it's not only mm -hmm. it's not only better for the environment it's better for for your health health yeah exactly like if you're cleaning you breathe in those fumes exactly yeah you can yeah. feel it like if you're using these like heavy industrial chemical yeah. based cleaners yeah. you you feel it straight away in your lungs I, yeah no it's nasty yeah it's really nasty um so interesting that you started a bakery and <laughs> what, what, you know obviously there was um a lot of learning I'm sure yeah. from it but yeah. what do you think the uh the most important thing you learned from from that experience was or about yourself even <laughs> oh god um oh, I think well I guess brave by the way yeah just, thank you <laughs> um I guess it was in, in, in a really weird throwback of like realizing the thing of when I was in secondary school of like oh figure out the things you're actually good at and enjoying and then just do more of that it was um I realized that the job that I had created before was actually better <laughs> yeah because you always think the new thing and the next thing and the bigger thing is better so I was like creating a business having a premises having staff managing staff you know um I always thought that was the next logical step, whereas realizing that actually what I was doing before, where I had like such a level of freedom of like going to events and writing at home and writing from anywhere, working from anywhere, suddenly I had literally like changed myself to a building. And because it was new and because it was a startup and because you had bootstrapped everything, I think like I already work a lot and like I'm aware that I should work less for just workaholismness, but because uh, that's a word. Um, but I had like, I think I, I started baking at like five in the morning and then I finished at 11 at night and, and it months and months in, it, there was no let up on that. Um, so yeah, it was definitely just realizing like, where are your limits? Um, it was funny after doing that, I was like, maybe a PhD wouldn't be so hard now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've done this with managed staff, but, um, but yeah, it, it was definitely that it was like, realizing that a good part of deciding what you want to work at or what you want to do is like not just what you want to achieve but what do you actually want to do day to day because what you do day to day is your actual life and so day to day I don't want to get up at 5 a.m and spend 14 hours in a bakery basically um and also realizing that like because then it had started to transition to um we were open to the public initially but then um just because we were so niche, that was difficult in our in living in a small town. We, we did a lot of pop-ups in Dublin and they were really, really successful. We would always sell out. We would make more at a pop-up in Dublin in a day than we would make in a week um, up here. But um, we started to produce wholesale for like hotels and restaurants and that was going well. And then just using the space for demos. But for what you're paying in overheads and rent and the fact that the condition had, of the unit was much worse than what the landlord had let on, for what we were paying for and what we had paid to do it up, you're like, I could just rent a room in the community center <laughs> and not pay rates and not pay all these overheads. So, so it was definitely like a learning curve for that of going, well, I really love the demos and I really love the education side. And I'm not getting to talk to people when I'm just behind the scenes 14 hours a day. Yeah. So that was, yeah. yeah, that's, that's so interesting. Uh, I, I love that about the, um, how, how you want your lifestyle to be you know mm. I, I i totally 100 percent agree with that because like your yeah. job is what like you know 80 percent of your life oh totally you know? yeah <laughs> no and and even and even though like now when i'm the days that i spend in killy bags can be crazy long like it's it's 12 or in, in it basically depends on daylight so in the winter my days are not so bad because it's eight till five which is still kind of long but in in the summer because of light and how long they can work it's seven till seven and it's an hour drive each way as well. But at least within that, I'm like, I like driving. I can listen to podcasts. I like spending, I don't mind spending 12 hours a day on the pier. I can go for a swim on my lunch break. It's a very different life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And were you still doing that work at the same time as the bakery as yeah. well? Yeah, <laughs> so I was doing six days or seven days a week for a while because I also had to pay off um, because the bakery had cost so much more to create than it was supposed to because literally we had to rewire the building plaster the building everything um it had been yeah much worse nick than when we had first looked at it 
um, it meant that I spent three to four days three days baking for wholesale and I also had a baker employed so she would be she would be working in the bakery when I would be working in kitty bags okay and then and then it was basically by like the December of that year which is like 2019 I was getting offered more and more marine work um and and it just didn't make sense anymore to to kind of keep the bakery going um and I had missed working marine anyway so and my baker was uh, she's an amazing, amazing baker. I hope she owns her bakery, her own bakery someday. She had a very small child. They're about to have another. Like she had enjoyed the chance to get away from her house and whatever and have a break. But it wasn't like she didn't need it to financially support her. So it was a nice feeling of like, okay, if I close, I'm not letting anyone down. So that was yeah. good. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, there's a, I guess there's in a way more awareness now than there ever has been with regards to sustainability and mm -hmm. the trouble that our ocean is in um and, and our, our oceans are actually you know yeah at, at a really <laughs> it's grim <laughs> it's 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 a really bad point in time for, yeah. for them unfortunately it can feel i suppose a bit like a, an insurmountable task to to make any kind of impact in a way mm -hmm. uh, i really appreciate the the way in which you share your knowledge and you give people ways to, to kind of navigate it that seem more feasible and possible. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I know you mentioned earlier the Sea Spiracy documentary and they'd make yeah. out like, like our only way is to, for everyone stop to fish stop right eating now. fish right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, it's, it's unfortunately, it's not gonna work for everyone. You know, yeah. I, I think people can make some impact on that and be more mm -hmm. conscientious about it but i wonder if you could um if you could speak a little bit about the things that you share what what are the what are yeah. the things what are the ways in which people can make an impact yeah for sure uh, one of the things that i really love to talk about or or where i'm coming from with most of the things i talk about is like i i think there's there's never enough um focus on the on the interim as in like we talk about you look at something like conspiracy and they say everyone should stop eating fish now and then we look at like where we are now in terms of like companies and plastic production and stuff like that and i think it's amazing that there's so many like sustainable companies um starting and, and opening in the world but then i think it's nearly like we've, we've demonized all industry so much that nobody wants to work with it and then nobody wants to fix what we already have so I'm like, how are we going to get to the better place without just accepting where we are now? So, so one of the things I like to do is um, look at like, okay, how can you be as sustainable as you are as possible now with the time that you have and the income that you have and the circumstances that you have? So, I mean, obviously the easiest thing for me to do is I always use myself as an example. And then I'm very happy for people to ask questions and I'll try and help them with their version. And mine would be, I live in a rental house. So when I lived in my other rental, um, I had the choice to choose my energy provider, so I cho chose a completely um, renewables-based energy provider. In my current house, I actually can't do that because it's prepaid power um, and, it's, and it's oil central heating. So with that in mind, I'm like, okay, well, what else can I do? I'm going to have to focus it outside the house. So at the time, I think if I'm using that previous house as an example, it was funny that I had a zero waste bakery that was completely... Was practically carbon neutral i can't remember exactly how we did it but um and it also was uh, it had no gas for the ovens and it was completely uh wind power, solar power or wind powered wow. so my business which is something you would usually think of as more wasteful actually generated less waste and less of a carbon footprint than just my domestic house so anyway so it's tangent but <laughs> but yeah it is it is like looking at where you are now because again it's also like everybody can't go out now and buy an ev like everyone can't have an electric car if you live early a lot of the times the range just isn't good enough on them or if you live where i live the charging point is never working um or it's not like i haven't seen a really good one for less than thirty thousand. you know it's it's not financially viable for most people so it is i, I am always trying to like meet people where they are so so like an easier combination is obviously pre-covid is like use more public transport and less of your car i have a very fuel efficient diesel car so while diesel is the devil <laughs> um it's still better than a really inefficient petrol car which is what i had before um i try to eat primarily plant-based because we do live in a country where it's actually cheaper to eat that way and often involves less packaging and less plastics 
Um, but that could look different somewhere else, you know, or like I got an amazing email once where I had, I had like done an event and I had did all, it was all plant-based recipes and it was all using things that you could get both from your supermarket and maybe like a bulk food shop. So there was no plastics. Um, and then I got a, a message from a woman who was like, I'm from a farming community. I grow all my own vegetables. I eat locally reared meat. And yet now I'm being told that I'm unsustainable. Am I? What should I do to improve? And I was like, no, you're just doing a different version. Like if you want to eat meat and you choose to eat meat, that's fine. That's your choice. The fact that you're eating locally reared, locally fed, grass fed, growing your own veggies, you're probably doing a lot better, maybe, or you're on the same level or whatever as someone who's okay eating completely plant-based, but everything is coming in plastics. Everything is being flown from you know it's cashews or macadamia nuts from australia it's almonds from california that are in their whatever millionth year of drought so it's, yeah it's just yeah finding finding your own version and i guess not feeling guilty about it um i definitely think that the biggest thing that people can do like we just talked about is is, is voting for change both financially with what you can what you have or or literally voting um is the other one yeah. I don't know if that's a boring answer. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's often the most simple things that we can do that have yeah, a big impact. Right? Yeah. What, what, are, what, in your opinion, are some of the most exciting developments haf- happening in, in policy or um, in the world in terms of changing our perspectives and reducing, reusing, and recycling? <laughs> <laughs> great question. That's a great question. I was thinking about that earlier. Um, I think in a weird way like progressive policies have been have been this is terrible english have been being created for quite some time what i actually think is really exciting is now the fact that people are aware so um there hasn't been anything particularly new or different that i have seen i'm a little bit worried about the carbon taxation plans because again i wonder if that's something that's going to leave lower income houses more in the lurch than they were before i'm a bit worried about how that transition might go but i think the greatest development has just been the fact that people are actually listening yeah yeah Yeah. that's awesome (laughs) (laughs) so aside from following wonderful people such as yourself (laughs) where where can people find more information and really get involved in in these best practices that's a great question um so i think yeah i think i think what a huge thing is finding what's local to you so um i I think especially with the different charity scandals that we had in ireland in the last few years people have become very skeptical of the bigger ones um but but maybe you know someone locally doing something like we have um obviously I've, i've talked about clean coasts clean coasts also have local groups so like Um, friends of mine run like the northwest coastal cleanup so that's so specifically like north sligo and and kind of donegal and so getting in touch with local groups like that or seeing like um if it's a case of you you maybe don't have time to volunteer but you would like to donate there's a lot of great um other grassroots organizations like um the the seal sanctuary or you know things like that where you can you can literally see what your money is going to like you fed four cubs this week (laughs) Something like that, I think, is really cool. That is really um, cool. Yeah. Do you are you aware of any in the UK? I have a big a bit of a UK based listenership. Oh yeah. So for UK um, based ones, I think a great one. Um, again, if people are interested in um, kind of seeing something different, then if you want, want to look at the plastics, there's um, the Two Minute Beach Clean is a great initiative in the UK. Um, I, I can't remember the name of the guy who started, but he also has a really good book um kind of uh, that really is has great information on kind of how people can get started and also information on beach cleans and then if you're interested in like I feel like people kind of pick a bit and then that's what they're interested in like are you interested in animals are you interested in water quality are you interested in plastics uh on the kind of water quality issue there's a great um uh, uh, foundation or group in the UK as well called surfers against sewage um and that's very grassroots um and they're kind of their big thing is just kind of um cleaning up the waterways that are are basically being dumped into uh, the ocean either from kind of obviously wastewater facilities or just what's coming through rivers and everything like that so um i think that originally came out of just like surfers getting sick oh wow and and different breaks around the uk um due to untreated water that's mad isn't it there's a lot of surf breaks around the world called shit pipe (laughs) oh gosh (laughs) 
not so attractive. <laughs> not so fun. <laughs> oh, there's one near my house. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> not in beautiful Bundoran. <laughs> no, they actually cleaned it up, but unfortunately the name's stuck. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Finn, where can people find you and have you got any events coming up in the near oh, future? Yeah. Um, so uh, I everything is of the same name. I, I did a a social media detox a while ago so i don't have twitter or facebook or anything like that i just have uh, instagram which is saltwaterstories.me um and then my website is the same so it's saltwaterstories.me like me um and that is kind of where i share everything that's going on or everything that i'm working on and i have a couple of articles and pieces coming out soon that i'll share probably all there but uh yeah not too many events as of late yeah i understand <laughs> even online yeah. Um, I will also say just for the listeners that your website is really beautiful and you have oh, a you. really nice blog with all your recipes up there. Um, so I definitely highly recommend people check that out. Um, it has been an absolute delight and a pleasure to speak <laughs> with you. you. It was really, great to chat to you. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule as well. No and um, I wish you a beautiful day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Cheers. Uh, Head on over to saltwaterstories.me or follow her on Instagram at saltwaterstories to find out and follow all the things that Finn is up to and really beautiful ways that you can be more conscientious about the way you go about sustainable living. Thank you guys so, so much for checking out the show today. I really appreciate and value your being here and especially if you stayed all the way to the end please make sure to like and share and subscribe especially if you're new here I really appreciate that and it really helps me to keep this podcast going it only takes a little click of a button or a few lines of writing so please do that and until next time be well